Hello and welcome everyone. It is one o'clock central, so we will get started. Thank you for tuning in to today's webinar, Work-Based Learning Activities for your CTE program. My name is Emily and I will be your moderator today. Presenting, we have Denise Dubois. Denise is the product manager here at RealityWorks and has been with us for a little over 10 years. She is a frequent presenter, trainer, and blogger for all things related to family consumer sciences, health sciences, EMS, and human services. Denise has experience teaching in Wisconsin and in Minnesota and has over 20 years of education, marketing experience, and professional development. We do have a few guest panelists joining us today as well, and Denise will be introducing those folks. But before we get started, I do want to cover a couple of things. First, today's presentation is being recorded and all attendees will receive a link to that recording, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint slides and the handouts that we'll be going over. For those of you on the live presentation, you will be receiving a certificate of completion for attending the live presentation. You should see that in your email within 24 hours after the webinar. We will have time at the end for a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat feature or the Q&A section located at the bottom of your screen. With that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and pass things over to Denise to get us started. Thank you, Emily, and welcome everyone. We are delighted that you've um, chosen to attend our, our webinar today. We have a lot of great information to share and we have a wonderful panel who will share their expertise in work-based learning. We've got Lynn April, who is the Director of Education for Economic Development for CISA 8 in the state of Wisconsin. We have Selena Mills from the Office of Career and Technical Education from the Michigan Department of Education. We have Michael Cobb, who is a Reality Works mechanical design engineer, but also a former technical education instructor from Western Wisconsin. We also have uh, Kimberly Baldwin, who is a family and consumer sciences teacher from Ponderosa High School in Colorado. And then I will be also sharing some free resources at the end of our webinar. So we are gonna go ahead and get started. We're gonna kick it off with our, uh, with our section from Lynn April. So go ahead, Lynn. Great, thank you so much. So as Denise said, I am Director of Education for Economic Development across two of the Cooperative Educational Service Agencies in Wisconsin, eight and nine, and that is in Northeast and North Central Wisconsin. So I'd like to start today by talking a little bit about Perkins 5 and drawing out some of the language in Perkins 5 regarding work-based learning. Um, so the information that I found in Perkins 5 talks specifically about tying your tech ed prep programs with work-based and worksite learning experiences where appropriate and available. Um, I also brought out the language uh, talking about high skill, high wage, high demand occupations, because we definitely talk a lot about that when we're talking about Perkins 5 and pathways in Wisconsin, and also equal access. Everything is about equity, and especially the Perkins 5 language, which re with regard to those special populations. So we want to make sure that any work-based learning that we're creating in our districts or across our states is equitable for all students to access. So why work-based learning? I found a great quote by the Brookings Institute, um, which talks about why work-based learning is so important to, to students. The educational and employment landscapes are riddled with systemic inequities that routinely exclude large numbers of people from opportunity. A more expansive vision of work-based learning should be part of the solution, emphasizing developmental relationships with adults, connections to broader social and professional networks, and authentic work experiences that provide hands-on learning opportunities and the chance to take on new roles and responsibilities. So what is the benefit for students of doing workplace learning? Well, definitely they foster, it fosters self and career exploration because students are able to clearly connect what they're doing in education with the world of work and those work-based learning facilities. Um, the, it develops a positive work habit and attitudes because students have the opportunity to actually experience some of the strengthening of those key soft skill areas like communication, attitude, teamwork, networking, problem solving, and critical thinking. It helps them to assess their abilities and strengths because work-based learning experiences provide those opportunities for students to really see what their strengths are outside of the classroom and then participate in job-related tasks that help them to align those skills with 
uh, the work-based learning needs. Um, it also expands their professional networks. Uh, students don't always know about networking, and so it gives them the opportunity to start making those important network uh, communications with the areas of careers that they are interested in. And then it also helps them to be better informed to make decisions before accepting a job offer, because if they're on the job and they're getting that work-based experience, they can understand what um, perhaps some of the benefits are that you can negotiate in jobs. And so students are more informed going in uh, in order to negotiate for those careers after they graduate from high school. There are definitely some benefits for the community as well. Uh, one of the things that it does is help to make education more relevant because work-based learning um, as a, a valuable component of that instruction for students helps them to relate their coursework and uh, have higher attendance and actual graduation rates increase because they can see how their education is more relevant. It allows employers to tap into a pool of skilled workers. So by connecting with students, at a younger age, employers are able to let students know what uh, their needs are as far as the skills that they're looking for in their future workforce. It helps to recognize the shared responsibilities for successful work experience, because not only do students get to know about the world of work, but also you've got folks that are in the field that are acting as mentors for our students. So they're sharing in the responsibility. Our employers are understanding the importance of connecting with their future workforce while that workforce is still in high school. So it helps to, to bridge all of those gaps and gives state agencies the opportunity to meet requirements of federal and state laws. Um, some of the uh, opportunity or the, the opportunities and um, uh, groups that are out there like the uh, Legislation for Individuals with Disabilities Education and WIOA, that those are some programs that we can start tapping into for students in the career field already while they're in high school. It strengthens community partnerships because it allows districts and those employers to be making connections while students are still in school. And it also helps to impact leadership development and genuinely engage people in their communities, both at the student level and at the employer level. So some work-based learning practices. What's happened in the state of Wisconsin is that the Department of Public Instruction has taken the language of per Perkins 5 and created a list of six components that need to be in place for work-based learning opportunities to be approved as part of Carl Perkins' grant process. So the components include sustained interactions, does not necessarily have to be a paid work-based learning experience. It can be unpaid, uh, but it needs to be at least 90 hours for it to count, quote unquote, as part of the Carl Perkins Perkins process. It needs to take place as much as possible in a real workplace setting um, or in a simulated environment in an educational institution. So if a high school, for example, would have a coffee shop that students can work in, that's a simulated environment that mirrors the real workplace setting. It fosters in-depth firsthand engagement with tasks required in a given career. It aligns with the course, so anytime students are doing work-based learning in the state of Wisconsin, it has to be connected with coursework that they're taking that reinforces the skills students are learning on the job. We do require a training agreement between the student, the employer, and the school that defines the roles and responsibilities of each of those entities. And then there's also regular periodic oversight and interactions that's usually meetings with the employer and the student, um, and along with somebody from either the community or the school district to make sure that stu students are actually achieving the skills that are part of that training agreement. And I've also connected on that particular slide, the brand new Wisconsin Career-Based Learning Guide. So if you're interested in work-based learning and what one particular state is doing with that uh, Perkins 5 language, you can check that out through the guide. Thank you, Lynn. It's just really so important for us to all have an understanding of the definition in the, in the Perkins 5 and just understanding all the benefits it can have for students, the community, uh, workforce, every, everyone benefits from this. So at this time, we are going to roll over into identifying activities for work-based learning for uh, several different CTE pathways. And we are going to kick that part off with Selena, who is going to be uh, addressing health science. I'm Selena Mills, and I'm with the Michigan Department of Education, and I work on overseeing our health science programs and work-based learning across all of our CTE programs in the state. And 
in health science programs in particular, we sometimes tend to focus on more of those off-campus work-based learning experiences, and we can struggle to connect students to the school-based or the extended work-based learning experiences in the areas of awareness and exploration. But these work-based learning experiences are really critical in creating a well-rounded CTE program and in helping our students to solidify their career goals. So an impactful strategy that we work with teachers on that they can use to enhance career awareness is the speed dating model. So the teacher can choose to highlight a content area, and here I've highlighted anatomy or diseases and disorders, and then invite multiple industry partners into the classroom to meet students and talk about their careers. So students would move from table to table or partner to partner, just like that speed dating, and the industry partner would tell them about their career and how it connects to what they're learning. And then the student has chance to ask questions as well. So this sets them up for maybe some mentoring in the future or some job shadow opportunities later. When we do this activity, it's really helpful to place the anatomical models and other tools related to the career field right next to that corresponding industry partner. So for example, if I'm a respiratory therapist, I would benefit from having a respiratory model or some tools to showcase. And that really helps our industry partner to focus those short conversations, makes them feel more comfortable, gives them something to talk about if they're, you know, if they're floundering. And then it helps the student to connect what they're actually using in the classroom and what they're learning to that career field. Industry partners can also help us with career exploration by getting more specific and sharing more in-depth information and experiences with students. So taking it a little bit beyond just that initial blush. As a teacher, you can hold focus sessions on specific careers, or you could even invite partners to come in and demonstrate skills that they used in their jobs. Students become a lot more engaged when they're able to use simulators and props and they're learning from an industry professional at the same time. And the benefit for you as the teacher is that it allows you to be more of a facilitator and to get an idea of where each learner is at in that learning process as you're watching those industry and student interactions. So an example of this might be using a geriatric simulator and asking a CNA professional or a nurse to come in and demonstrate how he or she would communicate with and assist and care for a geriatric patient. After that demonstration, you could have each of your students take turns being the professional and then the patient. And then that industry partner can offer feedback to the student on those skills that they're demonstrating. And then taking that all of, all of that one step further yet is career preparation. And our industry partners can be really valuable helpers in reviewing and giving feedback for those final skill or end of year checkoffs. They're also great at assisting in the creation and implementation of large simulation activities. So maybe putting together a trauma scene or an accident scenario for students and then running them through what it might be like to really be there. They can help conduct those mock practical interviews before certifications. They can help create joint service learning projects, and they can even participate in more specific role play or scenario discussions. So using some of those scenarios that um, they've either come across in the field or that you're provided with, they could help lead those and give a perspective from the field for students who don't have that much experience yet. So in general, when our industry partner begins to really know what equipment and what tools you have in the lab, along with the skills and the content that students are learning, they can really jump in and help to create a really meaningful real world opportunity and to help you extend the learning as they get ready for the next step. Thank you, Selena. You can see how you could take some of the ideas that Selena shared, maybe like the, the speed dating uh, activity, and you could certainly adapt that to almost any CTE pathway, not just health science. So these are, are great ideas and I hope that everyone uh, can take away several that you're gonna go ahead and, and try in your classroom to see if you can make those work for your CTE pathway. Um, we are gonna move on to Michael, who's going to talk about some um, activities that he has done in the skilled trades areas.
And we're gonna. There, I think I think you go. can hear me now. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Denise. Uh, as Denise mentioned, I taught a number of years in Wisconsin, and now I'm working with uh, Reality Works. When I taught in Wisconsin, we had, I I guess I would say before uh, 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 COVID, we had a pretty small number of students in in our youth apprenticeship uh, program. Uh, one to two students per year. It was kind of word of mouth. Um, we we promoted it, um, but it was tough to uh, reach the students. They didn't understand what it was. Uh, once in a while, their parents would, and all the adults in the room understood, but we struggled to get students hooked into it. So looking at uh, uh, just before COVID, we were taking uh, students on tours. Uh, and I would find or see students get excited on certain areas of a tour going into a manufacturing uh, setting, I should specify. And I would take those things that students got excited about and try to bring them into the classroom. And in one case, next slide, please. Uh, we visited a company called Catalytic Combustion in Bloomer, Wisconsin. And they were making uh, mufflers as well as other things that were confusing and unknown to the students. Um, but one of the things was uh, some mufflers and students recognize this muffler as a, uh, um, an item that's on an ATV. And I think it was a Polaris ATV. So having worked and talked with uh, the folks at Catalytic Combustion, uh, I asked them, could we take a couple of the muffler assemblies home? Uh, they did a lot of welding, a lot of CAD work. Uh, so I brought those into my classroom. And one of the first things uh, was how do you weld these things? And they saw some of the robotic welders and some of the manual welders on the uh, production floors doing these things. But until they get it and try it themselves, they don't realize how, how difficult it, it can be. And, uh, and it's a real world situation. Uh, they're, no, they're not welding uh, uh, what we call coupons in the welding uh, in the teaching area, uh, but it's all relatable. Uh, we welded, uh, students welded up uh, some production parts, uh, some successes, some not. And we had fixtures from catalytic combustion, some of them that they saw at the, uh, uh, on the tour for this uh, ATV uh, muffler. After that, I also took it into my CAD class, a number of drawings to make this uh, uh, part. Um, understand the print, a uh, real world situation again, not, not a invented thing. So now the students kind of, they start to understand what happens at catalytic combustion. In addition to the tour, now they're doing the stuff in the classroom. Uh, one of the specific CAD problems was to make this oval shape out of sheet metal and have it have the uh, intake and, and outtake exhaust uh, match up with this uh, kind of oval shape. So it's a little geometry, geometry, geometry problem that the students had to uh, accomplish in our CAD uh, program. So placement of students, uh, was difficult for us at, at a point, um, but because students toured the facilities and they worked on products, they were familiar with it. And, and they talked to each other. Hey, we're doing that muffler from that place in Bloomer. They may not even remember the name, um, but we've gone from, we went from asking students uh, to do a youth apprenticeship to students coming to us and saying, hey, I wanna go there. I wanna work there. Um, so we started, uh, placing students very easily. Uh, one was a welder and another one was a CAD technician. Uh, worked, moved into a youth apprenticeship uh, position um, very easily, uh, very enthusiastic. Uh, they understood what they were getting into. Um, we of course worked with, uh, and I'd recommend any teachers uh, work with the HR department. If I was to approach the uh, the welding manager on the floor, he'd be too busy. Uh, HR 
people at catalytic combustion in this case kind of opened the doors for us and kept the project going and uh, kept it on the on the front burner for the rest of their company uh, to consider a youth apprenticeship thank you michael it sounds like a just a terrific way to get business and industry connected with your ct program at school and what what a lucky thing for students to be able to participate in that real world application can definitely see how that would uh, definitely interest students in careers of that once they get that opportunity the next thing we're going to do is i'm going to turn it back over to emily she's going to play a recording from kimberly baldwin who's going to be sharing some work-based learning activities uh, for family and consumer science Good afternoon. This is Kimberly Baldwin from Ponderosa High School in Parker, Colorado, and I'm going to share with you what my department has done to create some work-based learning opportunities in our family and consumer science classroom, specifically in our child development classes and using the Reality Works infant simulators. So a little background. Uh, with our project and how we developed this. We started back in 2018, in the fall of 2018, and this really evolved out of a necessity um, to meet the needs of our students and staffing. I had hired another teacher in the department. I'm a two-teacher department, and the teacher taught the first week of school and then resigned. So I came in with a long-term sub and the person knew nothing about the reality babies and there was no way I was going to send four sections yeah, and do that. So this was our solution um, and I'll tell you more about what we do in a little bit. Current Tech Ed is moving in the direction of career readiness and this is really moving with it and it provides our students that are freshmen and sophomores with that opportunity to experience what it looks like in a career working with infants. Um, we have two pathways in our program. We have an education and training pathway which offers students up to 10 college credits when they graduate through our community colleges. Um, and we have a hospitality and tourism program that also has college certification at the top level. The classes in our education and training pathway include child development, which is open to 9th through 12th graders in a semester long class, and then early childhood education 101 and 111 that are concurrent enrollment through our community college, and then teacher cadet, which is um, an honors level curriculum um, for students that are looking at going into education or leadership and they receive four college credits through our community college partnership. So what we did to create our program is each class uses the infant simulators for one week. So depending on the number of sections, four sections, four weeks. Um, and it takes some planning on the part of the teacher that you're rotating, each section is doing these for one week, so they're a little off. You gotta create a plan of what they're doing the other three weeks, and at the end of the, the four weeks, you're all back at the same point. Um, so you assign each student an infant simulator as part or in pairs, and they assign a simulator. So if you have an infant, uh, a student that really struggles working by themselves, that's where you can pair them up. We have 20 infant simulators in our program, and we do have some classes of 25 to 30 students. So sometimes we pair them up, or if you have a student that you know does is not going to be there regularly, those are the ones you pair up. Um, in programming them, we start with the programming at the beginning of the week, and we stop it at the that end of that class hour at the end of the week. And when they're not in class using them, we place them in daycare mode and it works pretty good. So during the class times each day, the students do a check-in and safety station. And then they have different uh, stations that they have to go around 
and learn about the skills needed to care for that infant. So there's a diapering station, and they may need that several times during the class hour. A feeding station, which they feed the babies if they need it, but they're also learning about um, food and nutrition for infants and toddlers. Um, car seat safety, CPR, a playtime where they have some activities and craft things they can do, um, nap time, the importance of sleep, and then check out at the end of the day. So how we introduce this to our students is we begin um, the beginning of the semester with class expectations that they are simulators, they're a way to learn. We do a unit on what we call the PIES, Physical, Intellectual, Emotional, and Social Development Unit, um, Infant and Preschool. We always demo the baby and how to care for the basics of using the infant simulator and how to care for an infant before we do this. We have an introduction packet um, that we give them time to look through so they see the expectations and how they're going to be working with the babies in class and what they're going to be doing. And then for that week, the class time is spent caring for the babies and completing the packets of information. Um, and the content and the application of those concepts are things that they've built on throughout the semester in the class. Grading has two things because we've learned this in the last couple of years with the pandemic. Um, we do hard copy packets where everything's printed and it's all the information is there. During the pandemic, we did a lot of digital where they had Google Slides and they would tr make copies and um in insert work they'd create videos sometimes of them changing the diaper which is really a good practical um, assessment that they know how to care for the infants uh, these are some photos of some of the different stations in the classroom so we can see car seats some information about car seats sometimes the stations will include qr codes where the students watch videos this is the diaper changing station. You notice it is by the sink and they have gloves and they record things. Uh, this is the CPR station. So uh, American or the American Heart Association has infant simulators that they provide to new parents that may have an infant with a heart issue. Um, and this was donated to us by another teacher in the building. Um, you can see, also see here all the clothing is just kept in one area, so you're not having um, all that wear and tear of things coming in and out and things smelling like their dog or their food at home where you need to wash things every week. So um, a little evaluation of our project. Um, as we've been doing this really for about four or five years now, um, some of the advantages is that there's a lot less wear and tear on the infant simulators because they don't leave the classroom. There's less stress regarding setup and implementation. We're not sending them in home so we don't get those calls. The students really feel supported. If they're struggling, we're right there to help them out. And it's more accessible to students that need those learning supports. Um, those students that are on IEPs or need the, that extra help can be paired with someone else to care. Um, we have that real-time assessment of the students' abilities. We can see, see how they are working with the infants and the real-life skills in a child care environment. Checking the baby in, checking the baby out. Notations on diaper changes, washing your hands, those kinds of things. Some disadvantages are that the students do not get the experience for that overnight infant schedule, which sometimes in our early childhood education classes, then we will send them home overnight. There's less personalization for the students because they're using it in the classroom in that work situation. Um, the student absences can affect the grading and their outcomes and a large class size in the lack of the simulators. So if you only had four, I don't know how this would work for you. Um, but there's lots of different um, ways that you can implement it. Um, we also have some feedback from our advisory committee um, from an early childhood education specialist that it was a great way for them to really experience different developmental stages and career paths. Our community college also thought it was a great idea shifting it to the child care center and child care careers which are so much in demand. Um, and our building administrator said 
she doesn't get any negative parent feedback um, and she knows that the students are very actively engaged in caring for the infants during that time. Uh, we also have some student feedback in our slide. I'm not going to take time to read through that, but it's really a positive um, situation. Sometimes I see the real the babies when we send them home as a little bit of a love hate relationship, in the fact that um, they want to take it home and then some kids feel overwhelmed or something comes up with their family. Uh, so in our area, this has really worked out extremely well. Um, I'm seeing a little bit of an increase in our enrollment in our early childhood classes, our college level classes because of this. And um, I'm willing, I'm in class right now this afternoon, but I'm willing to answer questions if you want to send me um, a question by email and I noticed it is not on the presentation so my email is the all lowercase the letters K K Baldwin my name's in the front at D C S D K 12 dot org so it's for Douglas County School District k12.org. Thank you so much for listening to the presentation and I hope you have a good day. Bye. RealityWorks is really best known for our infant simulators and our task trainers that teach those transferable career skills. And we know from what Lynn shared that the Perkins 5 definition of work-based learning does include those simulated environments. So what does that really look like in practice? Well, instructors can generally choose from three models for simulate, simulated work-based learning. And RealityWorks has re resources that really fit strongly into those first two models, those simulated tools and scenarios that are designed to mimic the look and the feel of those actual industry tools to give students practice with them. And what's great about that, those models is the fact that students can practice realistic and potentially high risk scenarios in a very safe classroom setting. So some examples of the, like this could include um, our medical mannequins, our infant simulators, uh, bovine artificial insemination simulators, and welding simulators. And even to take it a step further, you could use some of our resources to create those simulated uh, workplace environments in a school. So instead of just having the tools in small scenarios, a simulated workplace is meant to make students feel as if they truly on the job and we can help you do that. So, you know, we know that this is common in health science simulation lab settings um, where they have a room that might be set up like a hospital for students to work through scenarios with medical mannequins as those patients. While our egg simulators could be used to create simulated larger, even small animal vet clinics. We could use those infant simulators as Kimberly just shared to set up a simulated childcare center. You know, you get the idea. So a few of the pros and cons of those simulated work-based learning. Uh, certainly the pros are it opens up those brand new opportunities for schools, uh, perhaps located in areas that uh, don't have the opportunities for the job shadowing, you know, clinicals, internships, and things like that. But some cons, sometimes uh, simulated work-based uh, learning comes at a cost. And sometimes also an additional issue is that uh, it, it's difficult to find ways to get employers involved. So just a few things to think about as you're thinking about simulated work-based learning. So a few examples from uh, Reality Works. We have here our bariatric nursing mannequin, and you could use that easily to simulate a nursing home environment. Something like our chest tube simulator, you could use that or even our infant vital signs in a hospital or sim lab setting to mimic what it's like to work in a hospital setting. For some of our fax products, our real care baby, we've talked or heard at length how Kimberly's using it for uh, child care uh, center simulations. You could use a few of our culinary tools like our butcher beef cuts to simulate a culinary uh, workspace. And you could even use a geriatric simulator for an assisted living work environment. <clears throat> a few of our skilled aids tools that we have, our welding simulator could certainly 
and be used to stimulate any welding shop or even our electrical wiring kit could be used to create a construction type of workplace environment in a school. And then for egg, we've got our bovine breeder artificial insemination uh, simulator that could be used to, to create a, a farming environment. The canine vet trainer could be used to create that large or small animal clinic. And then uh, our hydroponics tools could be used for uh, creating a horticulture or that type of a work situation. So there's a lot of ways to create uh, simulated work-based learning environments. So here's a few resources that we like to point out to everyone before we wrap things up today. First of all, we do um, have more webinars like the one today on a variety of different uh, CTE topics, and you can always register for free, just like the one today. And we record everything, and you can find them on the archive section of our webinar page on, at realityworks.com. Another thing that we like to point out is we have some more free lesson plans available at the link that's provided, and they are lesson plans on a variety of career exploration and CTE pathway areas. And we even also have a few interactive posters that you can print out and might want to post in your classroom all about different uh, work opportunities and career, career areas. A few of the other additional resources we have, we try to be really uh, active on social media. So we have a blog that we have guest writers, uh, product launch information and classroom activities and things that we share on there. Uh, Facebook is a great place to find uh, teachers weighing in with different activities. Sometimes they share uh, photos with how they're using some of our resources. Sometimes we even get students sharing uh, photos as well. And of course, Twitter we're on also. So we've thrown a lot of information at you in the last uh, half hour or so. And at this time, we would like to open it up for any uh, questions you might have. I know Emily has been uh, watching the chat area. Em, did you see any questions post us this afternoon? I did see a question come through regarding Kimberly's email, and I did enter that in the chat as well. Um, just want to remind everybody what they'll be receiving after the webinar. So within 24 hours, you will receive a link to the recording. Um, a copy of the PowerPoint slides, as well as the links that uh, handouts of the links that Denise shared. Um, and then for those of you who attended live, you will be receiving a certificate of completion for attending. And Denise, I'm not seeing any additional questions at this time. All right. Well, I would really like to thank our panel of work-based learning experts that were on today. Each of you shared great information that our instructors can take back. They can try some of these activities and integrate even more work-based learning into their CT pathway program. So thank you very much. And we appreciate your time today.